This is a, a really hot off the press uh, study. We literally only just uh, done the preliminary analysis and the data I'm gonna present. And I literally just got sent the slides. Uh, so <laughs> uh, it's gonna be really hot off the press. And I'm gonna be largely doing what you shouldn't do as a researcher or academic or speaker and just read from the slides. Um, and the slides are gonna be very dry as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you know they're not very sexy. But this is not a sexy subject, uh, which is uh, which is good. So it's appropriate. Um, and the title of this talk, for those who in the know, lost vagueness, of course, was a, a particular space they had at Glastonbury Festival uh, for a while. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you've been there, then you you probably have been lost uh, and having fear and trembling uh, in lost vagueness. So, but we're going to be exploring challenging psychedelic experiences uh, and this work uh, comes from the challenging psychedelic experiences project uh, which has been spearheaded by Jules Evans but is in collaboration with myself and some colleagues at the University of Greenwich uh, including thank you very much uh, Jules Evans and the the team uh, uh, Oliver Robson uh, Ros McAlpine Ashley Murphy Biner uh, Ed Prideau and Katrina Michelle, amongst others. Um, so yeah, the background to this is that there's a, a growing interest in challenging experiences. It's also one of those things that's been kind of left behind or glossed over in a lot of the research. You know, everyone looks to find all the, the beneficial effects of psychedelics, but the research into the challenging side of the experiences uh, has often been neglected. Uh, but we do have some extant data uh, from various recent surveys Somewhere in the region, anywhere between about 9 and 16% of people will have uh, long-lasting, challenging experiences um, from beyond a day or more. Uh, and in the case of our research, up to several years. Um, and that may include also HPPD, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, but also largely psychological difficulties of a variety of different types, which we're going to drill into. Um, so the project uh, was a kind of large scale, both quantitative and qualitative survey. Uh, we had over 600 respondents. They filled in a number of kind of demographic and uh, psychometric information. You can actually move forward from the bottom. Like I say, it's hot off the press. Uh, I keep going. Yep. And um, next one. Thank you very much. Um, so we had over 600 respondents. They filled in kind of psychometric and demographic information, uh, and also a, a kind of a number of kind of open-ended qualitative responses about the nature of their experiences, um, how long they lasted, how they coped, what support mechanisms they had. So it wasn't just about the cause of these uh, experiences or the nature of them, but also what people did to to deal with them. You know how they kind of managed them in the long term. You can. Keep those going. Yeah, thank you. And again, um, and from our survey, we found that a third of people reported difficulties lasting longer than a year. Uh, so some of these are extremely long term. Now, this is obviously somewhat cherry picked in a way because we're only looking at people who had challenging experiences. So we, we can't really say too much necessarily about the prevalence of these. But the, of those people reporting them, some of them are very long lasting. Uh, and a sixth of those uh, reported difficulties lasting more than three years. Um, we asked people to kind of fill, uh, kind of respond in their, their own way about the nature of the experiences. And we, we've just kind of gone through the data and looked at it doing inter-rater kind of responses and, and putting them into different categories. Uh, we had a, a kind of good degree of inter-rater reliability, first of all, uh, and then individuals will go through and categorize all the individual responses. Uh, and we came up with a number of uh, categories for, for difficulties. The first one was social and perceptual, cognitive, emotional, spiritual, uh, or existential, those to do with identity and somatic and behavioral. Uh, and overall, there was uh, 60 themes which, which went into those different categories. Um, 
The most commonly reported type of experience, I did say I was going to read this off the slide, <laughs> uh, uh, was by far and away uh, experiences of anxiety and fear, uh, including things like paranoia and panic, uh, social anxiety, uh, feelings of being traumatized by the, the, the trip itself, uh, fears of, of psychosis or going mad, uh, fear of dying, and a fear of hell, etc. cetera. Um, that was the biggest category by far and away. Uh, the second biggest category, well, kind of, is specifically the theme of existential struggle with meaning. Uh, but if we if we group together all of those experiences of a, a spiritual or ontological or existential type, they accounted for about half of all uh, difficult or challenging experiences, which actually, when grouped together, make it the biggest category. Things like ontological shock. Uh, the, the, the kind of reducing in size of the categories was derealization, experiences of depersonalization, and curiously, experiences of social disconnection, where, you know, typically we think of psychedelics enhancing connectivity between ourselves and other people and nature and so on. A lot of people also actually felt the opposite and ended up feeling kind of socially disconnected. Uh, so I'm going to drill down to some of these and give you some quotes. Uh, and uh, you can get a kind of flavor of them. So these are the ones for anxiety and fear and panic. Um, general anxiety heightened for a long time afterwards. A lot of issues, trauma surfaced. Even three years afterwards, I still felt different. So of course, a lot of these can be very long lasting. Another long lasting one. For about 18 months, I awoke with the sun every morning full of feeling of absolute terror. Sometimes my anxiety would be so high in the morning that I would physically shake from the energy. I have now an overwhelming fear of death. I have to say, reading through all these quotes just before the talk, uh, I think I kind of I, I agreed that I had pretty much all of these experiences at some point in my entire psychedelic career as well, uh, just not long lasting. Um, and in the following days and weeks, I became anxious based on a feeling that sanity was not reliable and could not be guaranteed. The first six months or so of the experience were incredibly difficult due to anxiety and panic. Uh, a lack of understanding of what I was experiencing and anxious symptoms remained for several years. Like I say, uh, existential confusion formed part of the, the biggest category, and that was kind of spiritual, ontological, and existential uh, difficulties. Um, uh, and a lot of these are to do with kind of reintegrating the experiences back into ordinary life, as, as you're kind of probably fully aware, you know, people going off on uh, ayahuasca tourism on retreats are there for a few days and they come back and suddenly it's a lot more difficult to, to make sense of, of their life. Um, so, you know, integration still is a big issue. Uh, I entered the experience believing that my experience is the literal real external world. The experience contained me with living out my worst fears, the deepest possible shame. Other experiences, thank you, so bizarre and dreamlike, I could not make sense of them. These memories left a legacy of confusion about what deeper model of reality to use and repeated experiences of flipping between these models at different times. Uh, so, in, in Chris's talk this morning, we hear about, particularly with DMT and other psychedelics, like these kind of huge metaphysical shifts that people often have, uh, but they aren't always necessarily easily assimilated. There can often be a quite a bumpy ride. Um, I found it hard to integrate the knowledge and experience of other states of consciousness with the modernity of suburbia and getting a job and earning a living. I can really sympathize with this one in particular. Uh, I think we probably all have a bit of that. So this is kind of playing into this trope that, you know, there is no such thing as a, as a bad experience. Yes, there are such things as bad experiences, and they can have long lasting negative effects. Um, but often, and I think in the, the Griffiths research, they found about 10% of, of people had challenging experiences, and of those, uh, you know, 80 to 90% felt that they had positive twist on it ultimately although you know a smaller fraction uh, felt that there was no positive spin to be put on those negative experiences but here's an example of one um, which had a positive ending in the long term i benefited as a person however in the aftermath period i was very disturbed by what i'd seen and found it difficult to integrate with my paradigm of reality i experienced a spiritual emergency 
and felt that I was losing the ability to function as a normal person. Again, normality probably needs to have square quotes. Um, experiences of derealization were also quite prevalent. Uh, I had what I afterwards understood was a severe panic attack. I went to the emergency room with an ambulance. After this incident, I have had heavy dissociative and surrealistic feelings all day, every day, and I still experience these issues daily, and it's been almost two and a half years. I couldn't differentiate between reality and the experience. I felt I had passed away and was stuck in purgatory. I couldn't function at work for six months. Um, well, obviously, if you feel like you're dead, that's quite hard to do. Uh, almost exactly two months after the trip, something happened. I was in a restaurant and all of a sudden I began to feel like something was wrong. I went to the bathroom. All of a sudden the bathroom was not real. It just looked wrong. I had to get out of there. But when I left the restaurant, the street outside was no, was not real either. The whole world was simply not real. And I felt like I had to vomit. Uh, depersonalization, which often kind of goes along with derealization as well, was also relatively prevalent, um, about 10% of the experiences. I spent a long time looking at myself in the mirror, which is something you should probably never do on LSD, uh, feeling like my soul was missing, like I was a hollow shell of myself and like I'd, I had already died. I felt like my mind had been shattered into a million pieces like my mind was no longer connected to my body and afraid that I was having a psychotic break. I'm still not 100% right, but I'm so grateful just to be back in my own reality. Interestingly, not many people actually said that they'd, they'd had a full psychotic break. Uh, I, think, I think it was someone in the region of about 1% of, of the people reporting challenging experiences. So the, 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 the actual incident of, of like actual full-blown psychosis long lasting seems to be relatively low, but nevertheless, challenging experiences of other types, or at least the fear or the feeling of losing their mind. Fragmentation of a sense of self, past and future goals, panic attacks, anxiety, dissociation, derealization, inability to work or go to school, had to drop out of college and live with my parents. Spent most of my time in bed, lost a third of my body weight, became suicidally depressed. Uh, and again, this is the one which might seem a little bit uh, unusual in that often people talk about having a deeper sense of connection uh, but a lot of people also actually came out of their psychedelic experiences feeling more socially disconnected. I felt very disconnected from everything and everyone around me. The trip was the most powerful experience of my life, starting off well, but turning into a roller coaster of intense feelings of panic and loss of control. I felt completely destroyed and terrified for weeks after, and with no one around me that I could relate to about it all. I think it's interesting what Neshe picked up on is this idea of community. This kind of, to me, speaks to the sense that we really need this kind of long-term aftercare, particularly with people who've been experiencing challenging experiences, but generally speaking, in helping people uh, integrate all their experiences. Uh, and that is a real kind of quest for greater community. Uh, I felt completely unsociable and anxious, struggling to find humor and things for a few weeks and struggling to know how I wanted to relate to friends, what to say to them about the experience when it felt like such a big eye-opener to me. Um, this is something we find from research with um, kind of spiritual experiences more generally or, or the literature on what we call uh, exceptional human experiences. Uh, when people have these are kind of metaphysically challenging, ontological, shock-like experiences, they often don't know what to do with the experience afterwards. Uh, and uh, finding people they can communicate their experiences to uh, can be challenging in itself. And they don't often feel like they can share their experience with other people for, for fear of being kind of labelled or stigmatised or uh, you know, people think they're mad. Uh, obviously, we've all heard people talking about their crazy psychedelic experiences uh, in this uh, arena but you know in the everyday world it's not always easy to find people to share these experiences with and it's a very common syndrome not just with psychedelic experiences but all manner of exceptional experiences uh the problems with being able to find people to communicate it with um but we'll come back to that in the kind of support and coping um uh, i'm not going to go through all of these because we've had a lot of the kind of quotes but uh, and we're going to move on to 
the, the kind of long-term kind of prognosis and how people dealt with it. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at the antecedents. Um, about 40% of people said that they felt that they'd had an incident of childhood trauma, which may have been connected to their bad trip or extended difficult, uh, challenging experiences. Uh, I can't actually say for sure whether what the kind of uh, percentage in the general population is of, of uh, childhood trauma. It might well be as high as that, it may even be higher, um, but that needs drilling into. Uh, the next one is that almost one third had a psychiatric diagnosis prior to the post-trip difficulties uh, and doing a quick bit of Googling. Actually, this isn't uh, an astonishing finding, the lifetime prevalence of uh, psychiatric diagnosis being about a third of the population anyway. So having any prior psychiatric diagnosis does not seem to be, in this survey at least, related to long-term uh, difficulties stemming from psychedelic experiences. It, whether or not you've had a psychiatric diagnosis in the past probably doesn't mean you're any more likely to have long-term challenging experiences. We also wanted to look into the age of the trip, uh, at the time of the trip. We haven't looked into that data. We've still got a lot more drilling down to do, uh, whether or not preparation and integration support was available, um, and ideas around uh, setting. Um, we did look at very quickly just uh, the, the kind of setting in which people did have their psychedelic, challenging psychedelic experiences with long lasting negative consequences. And about half of them had either tripped on their own, uh, not always hiking, presumably, uh, or uh, in groups or with friends or in a group setting, uh, perhaps ceremonial setting. Uh, very few came from clinical trials or, or therapeutic contexts, but probably the, 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 the number of people getting access to psychedelics through those routes is, is probably about equivalent anyway. Um, uh, and then we wanted to know, well, it's all well and good having these challenging experiences, but how did people cope? What, what did people find was useful or beneficial? Uh, right up there at the top, and these are in kind of, yeah, thank you. Um, the, the highest prevalence first was social connection just talking to people, talking to friends and family primarily uh, seemed to be the num number one way of helping to cope with the long-term negative consequences. Therapy came second. Meditation, also very useful. Uh, a variety of cognitive practices, acceptance, reminding oneself it will pass, distraction, focusing on goals, distan distancing oneself from one's thoughts, self-education, and finally, even exercise and a number of other ones. There was a whole uh, kind of range of different themes that emerged from that. And we also asked people um, about how they sought support as well. Uh, and of course, getting support was the, the number one kind of way of coping. Uh, the majority of people sought support from friends, uh, from other people who have had psychedelic experiences. And this really highlights the need for kind of psychedelic integration circles and groups and communities and just helping people forming communities to deal with these experiences. And finally, support from a therapist. Uh, what was helpful about that? Um, talking to someone and feeling heard is really important, just kind of sharing their experience. Feelings of acceptance and reassurance are also important. Helping making sense of the experience, and I had a lot this morning about sense making and, and meaning making, uh, and uh, whether or not people had actually shared their experience as well. So like specific support groups also can be quite key here, particularly we've now seen emergence of HPPD, uh, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, I hate that word, term, uh, online groups, uh, of which there are kind of hundreds of members on there who regularly share their experiences and, and talk about how awful it is having HPPD. Um, so that's the kind of overview of the study. Sorry for the extremely unsexy slides. Uh, I have to say there's a few limitations on here which I haven't kind of put into the slides um, and they seem to be kind of coming backwards. Uh, it is a self-selecting survey. Uh, people 
only signed up particularly if they'd had long-term challenging experiences so we can't say anything about the prevalence of those experiences um, the majority of the respondents were white by far and away more than 90 percent there was a kind of fairly decent gender balance uh in there uh but it is a kind of skewed sample uh and often you know quite highly educated as well um so it's, it's not necessarily representative either um some of the implications are that the mental health risks of psychedelics are not confined just to psychosis and psychotic episodes. In that fact, the risk of psychosis uh, in our survey seems to be relatively small. Um, but more in common risks like anxiety and panic and phobias, uh, that we need to be aware of the full spectrum of the possibilities of, of having a psychedelic experience uh, and inform people about them, uh, that we need to temper some of the hype that we have around uh, the panaceic nature of, of psychedelics uh, and that there's no such thing as a bad trip. Um, and uh, But also helping finding ways of people to cope with their experience, what, what have people done that helps them cope, uh, and how people can come about sharing stories, creating community and creating support. Um, uh, and we also want to drill down into, you know, what are the some risk situations uh, that people uh, may increase the likelihood of having a bad trip. For instance, with HPPD, uh, myself and Alex Irvin at, at Greenwich have been looking into this in some more detail, and it seems that, that there is a kind of a great degree of commonality between HPPD and visual snow syndrome. Uh, it almost looks like HPPD is actually a kind of late adult onset acquired visual snow syndrome. Uh, and it could be a visual snow syndrome is a good proxy for HPPD and visual snow syndrome is genetically inherited, then we could possibly screen people uh, and, and let them know the likelihood of the risk of developing long-term perceptual disturbances, for instance. Um, uh, but we also perhaps can help design, you know, trauma-informed psychedelic therapy uh, to reduce the risk of those people who have uh, childhood trauma and the dangers of re-traumatizing people uh, and develop more specialized kind of methods of integration. Um, and finally, what's next? We're going to carry on uh, with the research. We've got a massive amount of data, a lot of it qualitative, over 600 uh, respondents. It's a huge data set. Uh, we've employed some new research assistants and we're going to do specific interviews with uh, those people in the survey who said they're happy to be followed up. The, that was the majority of people uh, and so we're going to specifically look into those people who had very long-term challenging experiences uh, those that lasted more than a year um, and maybe some of the, the select groups like those represent with uh, exhibiting high anxiety or those particularly with existential challenges like ontological shock um, we're also uh, collaborating with the Fireside Project to do a longitudinal study, uh, looking at the different pathways after bad trips, uh, and uh, increasing public communication about the risks of psychedelics uh, and what we can do to help people who do get into difficulties. Um, and we're also, of course, seeking funding uh, for the next phases of the research project. You can find more about it at that link, challengingpsychedelicexperiences.com. And uh, Jules has set up a substack called Ecstatic Integration. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. Sorry for the very unsexy slides. Thank you very much.